Welcome back to the Valley Investors Club. I'm your host, Timo Vonolich. Let's get right into it with VIC Readings, the form of a look at the best of the best value investment recommendations by the best of the best value investors out there. Today, we have Denios Corp. Uh, ticker is DAC. Price at the point of funding is $61.61. This is not recommendation, not advice. Please do your own diligence before investing into anything. And please write down in the comments below, below if you have invested, will invest, so why not into Denios Corp. Description. The Naos Corporation is an incredibly cheap charterer of container vessels to liner companies. It trades at 0.48x net asset value on 3x EV slash EBIT and will earn its current market cap in cash over the next two years. That is cheap. By end 2025, an undemanding 5.9x uh, X cash PEX at multiple 0.78x price to book and normal uh, on normalized much lower forward earnings should yield a total return of 2.5x money back 38% IRR. I like that for investors at current prices. The substantial NAV underpin also gives investors a large margin of safety to the downside. One can have reasonable confidence in the outcome since two-thirds of the revenue is already contracted to 2025 at the peak pandemic rates with liner customers that are in excellent health due to a few years of very high spot rates resulting in prodigious cash flow and debt paydowns. The current average contact length, the contract length for Deneo's 69 vessels is 25 months. Mm-hmm. Like that too. The Naos is the owner and long-term charterer of container vessels to liner companies. The liner companies like Mersk, Mersk, MSC, and Zim handle the point-to-point -point logistics of transporting freight across the oceans. They deal with customers and are exposed to freight market spot rates. Linear uh, liner companies typically lease about half of their ships from charterers like the Naos, owning the other half of themselves which gives them operational and capital structure flexibility and reduces their overall risk. As the owner and lesser of vessels, the Naos is not directly exposed to freight spot rates and makes its money through longer-term contracts with the liner companies. Typically, uh, through time charters, where the Naos charges for the vessel and uh, separately for the crew, lubricants, insurance, etc., Ah, okay, so all of that comes from the Naos. At first glance, many may choose to pass on any company in the shipping industry since they are typically exposed to the whims of supply and demand and are capital intensive, typically earn fairly low returns on their capital and have no long-term modes to keep competition at bay. But at the current price, the Naos presents an unusually attractive opportunity. It is currently valued at near a 15-year low in terms of its enterprise value, despite being in its best financial health ever. Substantially under-geared, close to net cash by year-end 23, having more than its current enterprise value in contracted EBITDA locked in over the next five years, they are a fairly young fleet and credit-worthy customers that are just coming out of cash flow bonanza. The two main questions, risks, for an investment in the NAOs relate to, number one, the rates they will achieve on the vessels that come from come off contract in the coming years with a recession potentially looming and ports now functioning more normally. And number two, what management will do with the substantial amounts of cash the business will earn. Number one, on the first question, I've assumed that rates revert to the much tougher uh, 2019 period, about half of what they are currently. As each vessel comes out of contract, the NAOS provides vessel by vessel rates and contract terms, so this is easily projected. This assumption will only apply to about one third of the revenue in the next three years, with a balance still on current contract rates. The risk of a recession reducing demand is balanced by the shipping industry implementing environmental regulations that will force many vessels to sail more slowly to reduce emissions. This naturally limits supply in the industry, albeit that new vessels are being brought into the market in 2023 to 2025. On capital allocation, there's a 5% dividend in place and management have initiated a $100 million buyback of which they've already used $28 million by September 2022. 
In 2021, management did also commit to building six new vessels for delivery in 2024 for a total cost of $530 million, easily paid for with their cash or with debt, having ample capacity for, other, for either option. These new vessels will replace some of the older vessels in the fleet that are nearing the end of their useful lives. But on average, the Neneos fleet is only about 16 years old, with a container vessel expected to be useful for 30 to 35 years. Depreciation is over 30 years. Besides the dividends, buybacks and new vessels, managements, management are likely to be cautious with their cash, having been under tremendous strain during the decade before COVID as a result of an extremely high debt load of over 8x EBITDA coming out of GFC and a low charter rate environment. They will be opportunistic, picking up younger second-hand vessels if uh, they are attractively priced, like they did in 2021 when they bought six vessels for $270 million, yielding more than 10% in EBITDA on leverage before rates were negotiated much higher. I don't expect management to go empire building and splash massive amounts of money on a whole new fleet, but at the same time, I think they might sit on more cash than most shareholders would want them to and be slower to distribute it. Either way, the outcome should be more than acceptable. With 39% of the equity, the CEO, Dr. John Kustas, will call the shots. He's a shipping guy through and through, having inherited the reins of from his father 30 years ago, so may slightly favor growing his company over returning massive amounts of capital to shareholders. But with a large portion of his personal wealth in the equity, he's likely to think like an owner. It should be noted that this is not a high-quality business. It's capital-intensive, and although exposure to volatile daily charter rates is more muted as a charterer as opposed to a liner company, returns on capital are low at 6 to 10% historically. For this reason, I do not expect a high multiple on eventual normalized earnings, but as a deep value play with a high degree of uncertainty over the medium-term earnings and minimal debt, this should work out quite nicely and is very unlikely to result in a permanent loss of capital, making the risk low. The NAV underpin provides comfort in this regard. I'll start with a discussion of the current contracts. Look at the oversupply and demand environment for container shipping. Show how a conservative view on rates produces a fantastic amount of cash for Danaeus and returns for investors. And end with a look at management's view on capital allocation. How reliable are these customers of Danaos that have locked into long-term contracts? This is a key question since the investment thesis hinges on the certainty provided by the existing contract backlog of Danaos. What stops the customers of Danaos from defaulting on, on or renegotiating these contracts as the market charter rates drop? I can't really say it any better than the chairman and CEO of Global Ship Lease, a competitor to Danaeus, in their Q3 earnings call. Georgios Yorukos, a uh, German. I would say that the counterparties in container shipping, all the line of companies, they are in the better, in, in the best shape they have ever been historically financially. And actually, more than that. So they're all, I would probably say, net debt zero and lots of cash in addition to that on the side. So we are not worried about our counterparties because we also have only first-class names in our portfolio. Ian Weber, CEO. Further, we have industry starter charter standard charter contracts. They're non-cancellable. We only deal with the really good names. We've never had a bad debt in GSL. It kind of doesn't happen in our industry by and are large anyway. Linear companies are desperate for these ships. They need the charter fleet to run their scheduled service. Without the ships, they don't have services. So it's in their own interest uh, to ha behave properly. As George said, they're in the best financial shape uh, they've uh, probably ever been. So we're not all that complacent about it. But we are. it doesn't keep us awake at night. From the perspective of Danaeus specifically, their major customers are shown below in the split of their charter backlog and are all the same companies that GSL mentioned. We got CMA, CGM at 22%, MSC at 15%, HMM at 
13% makes others, and we got Habak Lloyd at 7%, Zim at 6 Costco Shipping at 5 and um, yeah, all the others are more. Uh, name outside of distress bankruptcy and restructuring these lease contracts do not have any precedence precedence of being renegotiated even during the gfc and the recent 2012 to 2018 shipping downturn in the case of zim's bankruptcy in 2013 to 14 the vessel owners received a debt compensation and large equity stakes which eventually yielded substantial returns for Deneos when they sold that equity during the recent upturn for zim stock when HMM was restructured in 2016, vessel owners received 100% compensation in the form of unsecured bonds and equity. Only in the case of Hanjin's bankruptcy in 2016 did almost all creditors get wiped out. And as the GSL chairman said, the liner companies are in the best financial health there ever been, so those contracts seem like a reasonable bet for the next few years. How will container ship supply and demand affect charter rates after roll-off? The rates that charterers are able to achieve are largely affected by the supply and demand dynamics for container ships by and customers. From a demand perspective, economic activity, which drives global trade, is probably a fair indicator for global uh, for general demand. From a supply perspective, container ships require a large capital outlay and take two to three years or longer to build. In addition, container ships age and are scrapped towards the end of their useful economic lives, typically between 25 and 35 years. These supply and demand activities can also have some regional nuances. For example, the major lanes from East Asia to the USA via the Pacific and from the USA to Europe via the Atlantic tend to have the larger uh, container ship 10,000 TEU+, plus, whereas other regions, the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, the Persian Gulf and the Caribbean, also use many of the smaller TEU vessels. Trying to predict the charter rates by forecasting the supply um, and demand dynamics for container ship is a fool's game. But I think it is instructive to how, have some idea of where the industry stands to make sure that an in investment into a container ship company is not being done at an absolutely irrational point in time. So this section will just uh, discuss uh, some of the main supply and demand elements for container ships as they stand today and this discussion will remain fairly general. As mentioned, I've assumed 2019's average charter rates when the current contracts roll off, which should provide some margin of safety. I've taken all the graphs in the section from the Q3 results presentation of global ship lease. From a supply perspective, the rate of ship scrapping over the last few years has fallen to almost zero. This makes sense, since the port congestion contributed to a practical shortage in supply which drove up the spot and charter rates, making it feasible to run older ships for just a few more years very profitably. The following graph shows this scrapping behavior for the global fleet as well as very low idle fleet ratio. New vessel build orders were non-existent during the COVID uncertainty, but these have been have since been placed with expected delivery in 2023, 2024, and 2025, amounting to almost 30% of the current fleet capacity. But most of these new vessels are for larger, uh, large container ships, and the smaller vessels below 10,000 TEU are only adding about 15% to their capacity over the next three years. Companies like Deneos and GSL have most of the fleet below 10,000 TEU, whereas Atlas Corp has predominantly large vessels. If you consider the smaller vessels coming online against the age of the existing smaller vessel uh, global fleet, likely resulting in some scrapping of older vessels, the net increase in capa capacity may well be less than 15%. I will take the second graph uh, below with a pinch of salt as that may be GSL management taking talking their own book to some extent. There may be some scrapping of older vessels, but many may run beyond 25 years for as long as the charter rate justify it. The final major factor to be aware of from a supply perspective is the environmental regulations. This starts to come into effect now in January 2023. Essentially, ships will be rated according to their carbon intensity and these ratings will tighten over time. If a vessel is consistently rated poorly, it won't be allowed to sail without corrective action. Many ships will have to slow down in order to hit their targets as a slowdown in speed results in a disproportionate reduction in carbon emissions. 
This is especially true of the older, less fuel-efficient vessels, which account for 80% of the global fleet. As most of the ships slow down, it effectively reduces global supply since it takes longer to get goods to their destinations. It is estimated that a slowdown of one knot by the global fleet effectively reduces supply by 6%. The two largest line operations, MSC and Marx, have said that they estimate the regulations will effectively reduce supply by 10% and 5 to 15% respectfully. There has also been a consolidation in the container shipping industry over the last decade. The multiple smaller players have been acquired or went bankrupt, resulting in a larger concentration amongst the larger liner companies. This greater supply side power may contribute to higher freight rates in future, which naturally would spill over to the charterers through higher contract rates. The following graphs show this shift in market concentration. So to summarize the supply size, uh, many vessels have been run for longer recently and the fleet is aging. This may result in a higher than average strapping of all the vessels in the next few years. In addition, the environmental regulations will likely take effectively supply out of the market and this will increase over time. There has also been an increase in market concentration amongst the liner companies over the last decade, which may contribute to a higher level of rates in future. To counter these supply tightening effects, there is a significant order book that will be delivered over the next three years. A lot of these orders will be in the largest container ships above 10,000 TEU. The nails recent purchase in 2021 and new build orders for delivery in 2024 are all below 10,000 TEU. From a demand perspective, economic activity is likely to slow down. An increase in global interest rates to fight inflation is likely to have a negative impact, a negative effect on consumption and global trade. This may be somewhat neg negated by China opening up again after the pandemic lockdowns, but the general economic demand outlook is certainly more negative than positive. All of the discussions above will affect the charter rates that the nails can achieve as the current contracts roll off. It is not possible to predict the path that these rates will take, but the factors likely to affect rates are not all negative. Importantly, the nails can afford to be patient with the rates they lock into for their charters, which was not the case before the pandemic. Fortunately, the current price of the nail stock does not require a rosy rates environment to produce a good outcome. An average or below average rates environment will be just fine. The following graph just provides a little context for the current short-term charter rates that have been achieved recently in the market, spiking during COVID, coming down now with spot rates, but not as quickly, but still well above the rates seen in 2019. In uh, Q4 20, uh, was, it was less than 50. Then in uh, Q2 22, it was above 200. And now uh, it is below 150. Assuming 2019's charter rates on contract roll-off seems like an assumption that is approximately conservative for the base case. The downside case is more severe, but still yields an acceptable investment outcome. Contracted rates for the medium term give a high degree of certainty. As mentioned, the NAOS has done an excellent job locking in its revenue at the high recent rates seen in the market. Despite this, the stock seems to be treated similarly to the companies in the sector where the market is watching the precipitous fall in daily container rates and selling shipping stocks accordingly. In the case of the NAOS, this does seem like a baby and bath water situation. For context. Um, you know, I can read this. Uh, due to the short supply of uh, container vessels, partly created by the port congestion during COVID, liner companies were scrambling for supply and willing to lock into charters for long periods despite the high rates. The following graph shows the total revenue for Janeo split between currently or contracted revenue, my base case forecast revenue on roll-off on, of current contracts based on 2019's much lower contract rates and my assumption for the new vessels being delivered in 2024. This is done on a ship-by-ship -ship basis. The rates assumed on contract roll-off from 2019 are based on the average rates uh, achieved by Deneos from that year for each vessel category. We see the actual reported revenue for um, 23 at above 80, the calculated from current contract sales, at above 90, the assumed from 2019 sales, um, 
in 26 at below 60. The assume for new vessels in 26 at uh, slightly below 60. And the uh, calculated from current contract sales for 20, 26 in at approximately 20. As you can see from the light blue area of the graph, much of the revenue for the next couple of years is known. 90% for 2023, 68% for 2024, and 43% for 2025, which takes much of the guest work out of my any forecasts. In addition, the rates used from 2019 are probably conservative since that was a particular poor period from a rates perspective. The NAOs can now afford to be more patient since they don't have a heavy debt load to service, having paid down substantial amounts of debt in recent quarters. When comparing revenue from the start of the pandemic, low 40 millions uh, per month, to that being forecasted by 2026, uh, plus minus 60 million per month, keep in mind that they bought a six secondhand 5,500 TEU vessels in 2021 and sold two 6,400 6, 6, TEU vessels in November 2022. Six brand new vessels are also being delivered in 2024, as shown by the light gray area on the graph. Also be aware that the high pandemic rates locked in for long periods continue to boost overall revenue into 2028 as compared to that earned pre-pandemic. You'll notice from the graph uh, that there's a slight difference between the actual report revenue dotted line and the revenue from current contract sales. Where the calculated revenue is higher, it stems from downtime for repairs and maintenance of the vessels. Where the reported revenue is higher, some vessels may have come off contracts and were chartered at the market spot rate, which was particularly high in 2021-2022. To cater for this difference, I've assumed a 5% downtime in my revenue forecast below and only take 95% of the calculated revenue, which is consistent with management's expectations. As mentioned, the rates assumed are for different vessel categories. The NAOS generally reports on its vessel according to their size, determined based on the TEU, 20-foot equivalent unit, uh, count or number of 20-foot 20 uh, 20 containers the vessel can take. The following table provides a summary of the vessel categories and the rates that NAOS has uh, achieved. My base case assumption 2019 average rates and a townside case assumption 2019 minimum rates are shown relative to current rates. Note that in some cases, the smaller vessels have higher current contracted rates. This is largely a function of when the vessels came out of the previous contract and the market's appetite for charters held at the time. With the exception of the smallest vessel, the fleet is fairly young, meaning that a large replacement program should not be necessary over the next few years. For the nine, uh, for the nine smallest and oldest vessels, I've assumed that they are scraped, uh, scrapped at the end of their current contracts without any allowance made for residual, residual scrap value. They're on the books for about 25 million collectively. However, assuming Deneos can get decent rates for them, I expect them to keep running for a while longer as container vessels have an expected useful time of 30 to 35 years. Or at the least, very, uh, very least, Deneos will get some scrap value from them. Deneos base their depreciation on $300, uh, dollar ton per, $300 per ton of scrap value. With regards to the new vessels, they should command a premium to other vessels, their size considering they are brand new and fuel efficient, so uh, will fit nicely into the new environmental regulatory regime. The key takeout from the table above is just how high the current contracted rates are relative to those achieved in 2019, almost double. This has and will continue to lead to super profits and more importantly, cash flows for as long as these contracts run. Some up to 2028. From a valuation perspective, it then becomes important to determine more normalized earnings sometime in the future after factoring in the substantial cash earned up until then. Financial projections highlight the deep value opportunity. The value of Deneos is a dependent on the near-term cash generated as it is on the eventual normalized earnings and associated exit multiple theory on. This is comforting from a valuation perspective because the near term earnings are highly uncertain, uh, highly certain. Sorry, I consider 2026 to be the first year or of more than normal earnings since they turn upwards again thereafter under my assumptions. Revenues are modeled on a vessel by vessel basis as discussed above. 
From a margin perspective, I've assumed that the current high GP margins come uh, down to historical lows of 71% with EBITDA margins following suit as operating expenses grow at 4% annually. But what is certain is that reality will turn out differently from the figures modeled. I've tried to be conservative to be on the right side of the actual outcome. The following table provides a financial snapshot of the income statement and a key balance sheet matrix, especially the buildup of cash over time. A few things to draw your attention to working from the top down. The 2026 EBITDA margins are at 10-year lows, highlighting the conservativeness in the margin assumptions. Depreciation decreases in 2023 with a sale of two vessels in November 2022 and then increases in 2024 and 2025 with the purchase of six new vessels. I've made no adjustment to the depreciation for the scrapping of the nine smallest vessels at the end of the current contracts as their current book value is only about $25 million collectively. We have clarity on the debt repayments, which, with the exception of 263 million, uh, 8.5% uh, 28 note, are contractually amortized over time. The interest on the debt is fixed on the 20, uh, 263 million unsecured notes, LIBOR plus 2.5%, and uh, on the 2.5% 2, 2 on the 450 million Citibank NetWest facility running to 2027, and RFR plus 2.5%. Uh, 16% on the 125 BNP Paribas facility, also running to 2027. I've added a 1% additional buffer to the current interest rates for the two linked facilities to allow for further interest rates increases. I've also assumed 2.5% in, uh, interest on positive cash balances, remaining flat over the term. The dry docking capex shown is in excess of that already included in cost of sales. The accounting methodology amortizes the dry docking capex over time as an expense, but there are years where the cash outlay exceeds this amount. By 2025, I've allowed for one third of the vessels to be dry docked each year at 1.5 million each. This seems conservative based on the history. I've assumed that the dividends, buybacks, and some of the payments for the new vessels are funded from cash. The balance of the new vessels are paid for with debt in 2024, which adds about $313 million to the debt, uh, to the debt then. Resulting in 60% debt funding for those new vessels that cost $530 million in total. See Capital Allocation section for a discussion on the funding of the new vessels by the G CFO. Despite this additional debt funding and the reduction in the EBITDA over the next few years, the total debt to EBITDA ratio, excluding cash, remains very manageable, peaking at 1.8x in 2025. Management have said that they don't want to go above 3x EBITDA, so there is still plenty of room remaining. Keep in mind that this industry tends to be fairly highly geared, with debt secured against the vessels in order to earn a decent return on equity despite low unlevered returns on capital. From the main listed competitors, Atlas Corp is currently at 5.2x net debt to EBITDA, Costa Mare at 2.7x and Global Ship Lease at 2.3x, all of fairly uh, inflated recent EBITDA figures, all of elevated EBITDA figures. By year-end 2023, Deneos uh, should be close to net cash, so is certainly an outlier. I've grown the dividend per share by 15% per year. Management have said that they want the dividend to grow steadily over time, and this is the easiest way for them to distribute some of the cash on the balance sheet to shareholders. By 2025, the dividend payment is $88 million, which is 32% payout, based on 26 normalized earnings, so uh, still very much maintainable. A steady increase in the dividends currently yielding 5% on the stock should act as a catalyst for the stock price. Regarding the buybacks, I've assumed that the buybacks in Q4 match those in Q3 of 22, then that the remainder of the $100 million buyback author authorization is exhausted in 23. In Q4 2022, shares are assumed to be bought back at current prices and for 20% more in 23. A further key catalyst for the stock uh, could be an increase in the buyback authorization. Author authorization, I'm sorry, not a model above, which is what I'd like to see from management when the current buyback authorization is exhausted. I'll be looking out for mention of this at next week's earnings call. There's unearned revenue that should be deducted from cash to get the true cash value. I don't view this unearned revenue as debt. 
It is contra contracted revenue paid in advance for some of the vessels. In reality, this unearned revenue will come down over time and cash will be slightly less, but I've just kept it flat and allowed the cash to grow in line with the EBITDA. The net effects is the, the net. And this is, uh, and this while arguably being undergeared at that point, considering the tremendous value asset value of almost three billion in addition to the cash. Given the expected earnings and cash flow, what would, could an investment in the nails yield for investors? As mentioned, for me, it was important to get to the point where earnings normalize. Without that, how can one put a multiple on the business? I see this happening in 2026, so have worked accordingly. The valuation can be looked at from a number of perspectives, namely an EV EBIT multiple based on normalized earnings to factor in the cash and debt on the balance sheet, as well as the substantial depreciation in the business. This is to approximate a normalized pre-tax cash earnings yield. An X cash PE, assuming debt at fair levels, because the business does not pay income tax, so an EBIT multiple perhaps doesn't fully reflect this benefit. A price to book value, since this provides an underpin for value. And comparing the above to similar companies in the market. The following table shows the return from today based on an 8x EV EBIT exit. The base case uses the 2019 average rates from uh, after current contract roll-off and the downside case uses the 2019 minimum rates. Take note of the relatively small gap between the base and downside case returns despite a 23% difference in normalized earnings. This stems from the significant cash buildup in either scenario, from the current contract rates, which reduces the reliance on hitting a specific exit multiple and determining what the eventual normalized earnings will be. Cash makes up more than half of the EV in 2025 under both scenarios. The exit multiple of 8x EV EBIT seems to be on the lower end of a fair range for this business based on normalized earnings. This is a 12.5x pre-tax yield and what I assume is a 6-ish long-term government bond rate environment. The following graph, uh, graphs for comparative companies provide some support for this multiple. The price to book and X cash PE are also useful metrics to consider for the nails. By end 2025, the business is 1.8x gross gearing and is still trading at 22% below book value and 5.9x uh, cash forward PE, the market cap shown in the base case. For context, based on the normalized earnings in 2026, the business has an X cash return on equity for 11%, which strikes me as conservative based on its history. Also note that the exit multiple is based on forward lower earnings, at which point I expect them to start trending upwards again. I'm assuming that the market becomes more aware of the tremendous value inherited in the business within three years. If one waits till 2026 to apply the multiples, then the business will earn a bit more cash in the interim year, increasing uh, the times money back 2.8x, but lowering the IRR slightly 31.9% due to another year of discounting. The following comparative graphs provide some context for the reasonableness of the exit multiple assumed above. Note that in two of the examples, the multiples have come down, which is what you'd expect from businesses that are over-earning right now. Atlas Corp is the largest competitor charterer with a market cap of 4 billion and a uh, 10 billion EV and about a 3x the TEU capacity of the NEOS. Its average EV EBIT over the last decade is above 13x with an average price to book of 0.86x. Uh, Customer is the second largest listed competitor with about 25% more TEU capacity than the NEOS. A similar market cap and about 3 billion EV. Its average EV EBIT over the last decade is just over 11x with an average price to book of just over 1x. The last listed comparable is a Global Ship Lease. Uh, it is about 25% smaller than Deneos and uh, from a capacity perspective and is also trading very cheaply right now, although not as cheap as Deneos. With a market cap of just under 7 million and an EV of 1.5 billion, GSL has an average EV EBIT of 8.5x and average price to book of 0.5x over the last 10 years. Capital allocation, opportunistic vessel purchases, increasing dividends and hopeful increased buybacks. As mentioned, management will use the cash building up on the balance sheet for three main purposes. Paying a regular dividend, buying back stock and investing in vessels. Deneos increased the dividend by 50% in March 2022 and are committed to paying a regular sustainable dividend. 
They announced the current $100 million buyback, a program in mid 2022 as well. And I expect them to have used $51 million of that capacity by end December 22. As investors, we would prefer to see more of the excess cash coming back to us specifically through buybacks at the current low valuation. But one must view the current buyback program and the context of the size of the free float is since 41% of the equity is held by insiders who are long-term holders. That means that, a market cap, uh, that at a market cap of $1.2 billion, the buyback authorization is about 40% of the free float, which is sizable. Management definitely want to keep a fortress balance sheet uh, to take advantage of opportunities as they come. That means buying vessels as much as it means buying back stock. So I wouldn't expect a massive, de incre uh, a massive increase in the return of cash already announced. They may extend the current buybacks and gradually increase the dividends over time. Right now, Deneos is certainly on the levered and they're aware of that. In terms of exactly how management thinks about capital allocation, I think it is very instructive to read what the CFO said in an interview in mid-2022. This is rather a long, wordy section, but really shines a light on how they view the use of cash in the business. Regarding, of, uh, regarding the size of the share per repurchase authorization, we will use it when we consider it appropriate. We will monitor the share price and we'll, we will act accordingly. It's up in the, to the discretion of the management to execute on it when it considers it appropriate. Why the $100 million uh, number and not more? $50 million was too little. $150 million sounded too aggressive. We don't want to hurt the float. We want to maintain the, liqui li sorry, the liquidity trading characteristics that the stock has. Regarding the economics of the new builds and overall target leverage. Of course, uh, the new builds will be financed. In terms of getting the best possible financing terms, if anything, it's the new builds that are going to get them. And we're uh, conscious about uh, securing competitive financing arrangements. So the new builds will be financed. Actually, we are sort of deleveraging at this point using all the cash that's coming in in order to delever much of the older fleet. And this is a work in progress. We're mindful of the overall leverage, which at this point, net debt to EBITDA is below 1x. It's going to be closer to 0.5x at year end. We don't intend to remain at those levels. Obviously, this is going to go up and it will be a function of financing for the new buildings. And of course, if the market turns, the market softens and EBITDA falls in two to three years time, uh, we've said uh, we don't want to be above 3x net debt to EBITDA through the cycle. So we are mindful of corporate leverage, but definitely new buildings will be financed. We have not yet secured charters for the six ships because it is in our view that we will maximize I'm sorry. It is our view that we will maximize returns if we wait out a bit. And I believe within the next months, uh, probably within the next year, we will ultimately fix the ships and we will get a better outcome if we have fixed them concurrently with the signing of the contracts. John said, we can afford to do this because even in a worst case scenario, we can fund them all with equity anyways. So we are not going out on a limb ordering 20 ships without a charter that if we cannot charter them, uh, then the financing would be a problem. Then he went on to say, we have already circulated the specs of the ships. There is quite a bit of interest. Uh, we're taking our time. We're not in a hurry. My expectation is that within this year, we will end up fixing them. But we can afford to be patient and again, maximize the outcome. So that's what we intend to do. We are targeting double digit unlevered uh, uh, returns. Okay. That's our target for the next vessels. And depending on leverage, you could get uh, equity returns in the high teens. That's what we're looking for. And this is why we did not pursue transactions that others did, which is not a good fit for us. On the amount of leverage uh, when financing the new vessels, it could go up to 70 or 80% easy. And especially when you have a good charter in place, you can maximize leverage. Although maximization of leverage is not always the sole target, right? As I said before, we are mindful of the development of overall corporate leverage. We care about our credit rating. We were recently upgraded by both S&P and Moody's. We are conscious of the credit quality that we need to have in order to have uh, also better access to the public debt markets. And actually for the specific financing of those ships, we want to get the lowest possible cost right.
because these are top technology vessels. They uh, will have very good charters. And so whether uh, we lever them at 65 or 75 or 80 percent, the extra lever uh, leverage is not going to solve any problem for us. But if we can secure much better terms at 65 or 70 percent, we'll go for them. It's not that the sole objective is to maximize leverage. On concerns by investors as to whether Dineos is just going to blow their cash on building their fleet instead of giving the cash to shareholders. We have historically built many ships and the general rule of thumb was that we built them on the back of charters. So I don't really see what we're going to have an expanded uh, new building program all on speculation. So we will do a bit of mixing and matching. It depends on many factors, on when you place the order, how the new building prices are moving, when the vessel is due to be delivered, because the further out, of course, the bigger the risk. In this instance, uh, for the next, uh, for the six ships delivered, deliveries are reasonably soon, let's say 2024, where we felt pretty confident that people would fix those ships within the year. If you offer 2025, uh, 26 slots, it starts being different. And again, building on speculation, a big order book is not what we're in the business of doing. So you should expect more, not necessarily very soon, but you know it is on our minds. We need to re renew the fleet. We need to find the right balance on capital allocation between reinvesting in the business and rewarding shareholders. We care about long-term value. So you cannot pull put out you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. It would be the easiest decision in the world to splash out the money to shareholders right away. It is not how we think. We've made that very clear. We're trying to be very transparent about our thoughts on a capital allocation. We want to invest in the new technology of ships that are going to be, mm, you know, they, they will form the next generation of container ships. We'll do so gradually. We are going to be very mindful of striking deals that bring us the appropriate returns. We are not going to grow for the sake of growing, if that's what people are concerned about. We care about profitability and we have demonstrated that because we've only done six new buildings, we haven't done 76. And the reason for that partially has to do with uncertainty on future te technology around fuels and also st sticking to our return targets because we have seen a number of new building projects offered with charters that generate low single-digit equity returns on the back of 90 or 95% leverage. We don't believe these projects make sense. That's why we haven't entered into any of them. On taking advantage of opportunities and keeping some powder dry. You need to strike when the time is right, typically in shipping, and that's what people sometimes forget. And that's what people sometimes forget. It, in shipping, you make money not when you're investing in the top of the cycle, but when the market softens. And that is when you have, to have the balance sheet to source accredited growth opportunities opportunities and offer outsized returns. Borrowing from Jamie Dimon, uh, we want to build a fortress balance sheet and that's what we are doing. The market is offering us the opportunity to do so. Not just because we want to have a nice balance sheet, but exactly because we want to be able to use this balance sheet and take maximum advantage of opportunities that will, that will present themselves going forward no matter how the market moves. So in summary, I think management uh, are going to keep cash on the balance sheet to try to take advantage of attractive opportunities that the market offers up. They are aware that they are currently underlevered and will almost certainly finance a portion of their new vessels in 2024. They have overall return targets of double-digit unlevered returns and high teens equity returns that they are aiming for and because of their current financial health are in a position to be patient and strike at the best possible times for both new vessels and buybacks. They do not seem likely to go out and indiscriminately splash their cash to build a whole new empire while ignoring returns on capital or equity. Conclusion this is a cyclical and low return on capital industry that is vulnerable to global dynamics outside of its control. It is normally deeply unsexy from an investment perspective. However, in this case of the NEOS, there's tremendous value to be generated in the next few years from its current contracts that will produce large amounts of cash for the business. Even without a massive additional buybacks, a steady dividend and build up of cash on the balance sheet should slowly pull the stock price upwards to a more fair value. 
If management does uh, find ways to spend the cash on hand, it will likely be on vessels with charters in place that will grow earnings. The NAV inherited in the business acts as a value underpin, which, together with the current cash, makes a permanent capital loss from here unlikely, bearing a major war or some equally devastating global catastrophe. All around this is a deep value play with a fairly high degree of certainty, heavily skewed in favor of investors at this price. The outcome could arguably be better than that shown in the base case above. Higher future rates than 2019, more buybacks at a 10x EV EBITDA exit multiple, or simply a faster recognition of value by the market could yield even higher returns. Keep in mind, however, that once fair value is reached, then it will probably be best for investors to sell and move on because of the quality of the business slash industry. Catalyst. Value should be its own catalyst here. Over time, uh, specific, uh, specifically, has more and more cash builds up on the balance sheet. As the market recognizes the continued strong earnings from existing contracts, despite the freight rates, I think this value should start to be recognized. In addition, I expect increases to the dividend and more share buybacks to act as catalyst. Thank you very much for tuning in and see you next time. Uh, please write down in the comments below what you think of this idea, what you think of this opportunity. And please